Before his time in Minnesota, Brian worked for the Wisconsin DNR for seven years, also as a tree health sleuth. His expertise is in diagnosing what is wrong with trees and monitoring broad scale trends in forest canopy health. Brian has a master's degree in plant pathology from the University of Minnesota and a bachelor's degree in forestry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And lucky for us, his favorite type of audience to speak to is a master gardener group. It's true. I, I actually, um, when I was done, so I did my master's at the University of Minnesota and when I was done, my first job was with Oregon State University Extension. And so I got to work with master gardeners and master woodland owners a lot. And it was fun. The fun thing about it is that you guys are here because you want to be here, which is not, I, I don't know, it's not, it's not always the case when I speak to a group, so. Yeah, and it's nice to see everyone's faces too. Um, I have a hard time, you know, it's so convenient that we all can be in our homes um, doing this kind of thing. There's a lot to be said about that. Um, and it's convenient for me too. But I have a hard time not speaking in front of human beings in front of my face. I think it's just because of my speaking style. So that's my excuse for not being a great speaker tonight. But um, let me see if I, I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm gonna share screen one. So you should be able to see my presentation, my first slide. Um, and hopefully you can't see my cheater speaker notes because that's also convenient about speaking remotely. Um, definitely tell me if something's, something's going, up, going wrong with like my slides aren't showing up or whatever. So um, let's get started here. First of all, I'll just explain a little bit about the team I'm a part of. Here's the team, um, my four, my three counterparts, and you can read all of their names there. They basically cover the northern almost half of Minnesota and I cover the southern half. We have a team coordinator and then we also contract out with this guy on the left here. He does most of our aerial survey. So that's the team. And our, our bread and butter is to investigate um, forest health, really tree health mysteries in forests for forest managers or like large private property owners. And so you can see all of these dots here, you know, in the southern half of the state, those are all site visits I made. And um, it's a great part of the job, solving tree health mysteries like some of these pictured on the left. Um, then you know, maybe 20% of the job or so is I coordinate the annual survey. Um, we do it in airplanes. Everybody asks nowadays, why don't you do this in drones? Um, well, an airplane is super efficient. We're talking like pennies on the dollar relative to a drone, which I know a University of Minnesota researcher flew a drone over, I think, 15 acres. I think it cost $30,000. We can fly the whole state, um, you know, at six mile flight lines or sometimes three mile flight lines for, I think, 50,000, the whole state. So um, an airplane still is the way we, we do things to track these trends. And you can think of this part of the job really as like, we're kind of like the CDC for Minnesota's forests. Um, those, the green tracks there are done by a, a federal US Forest Service aerial surveyor, and then the DNR does the rest. Um, we have what I think is a great web page. Um, I would, I'm super biased, but I'll tell you there's a lot of information online that's not accurate. Um, if you go to our webpage, you can at least know that this is what this is what I want to communicate to people um, and my teammates. So um, there's a lot of information here. Um, we do put out a newsletter about three, generally three times a year um, in the growing season. So you can sign up for it on our web 
our homepage here. So to get into the meat and potatoes of tonight's topic, 2021, it was quite dry. And I just love comparing droughts. Um, I gave a whole drought talk this past week to a group of about 100 foresters. And I really got into, into the weeds on droughts. But I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds on droughts this tonight. Um, so this map is a growing season. So April 1st through the end of September of 2021, it shows you these different colors represent the all-time ranking of the precipitation. So just take a look at that brown color, the bottom rung there. Any area in Minnesota that is covered in brown, like up in the Northwest here, just south of Lower Red Lake, and then over here in the small part of the Arrowhead, that brown represents since records have been kept modern day since 1895, those are in the top five driest for this period. So you can see that, you know, sizable chunks of northern Minnesota and then south central Minnesota too experienced really um, near record droughts, sometimes record droughts, I'm sure, in some of those areas. Um, look at Dakota County. Dakota County is a really great example of how <coughs> drought can vary on very on a small scale. You know, so like in like almost northern part of Dakota County, it had in the growing season, you know, top 20. But well, either the, the between the fifth driest and the 20th driest growing season, but then the, the little section in the southern part of Dakota County, it wasn't nearly that dry. So the whole point with this map is just, A, it was a dry growing season for a lot of Minnesota, and B, drought. You know, we, I love to listen to Mark Seeley on Friday morning and all kinds of meteorologists, and generally people speak on statewide scales or county scales or, or climate scales, and, you know, it varies hugely. And, and so tonight, I'm going to describe droughts in what are called Minnesota climate zones. So there are nine. I'm not going to include these western two because there aren't many forests over there. Um, but just to give you an idea of how the drought of 2021 was relative to the past. And so my question is, when was it last drier? in the spring since 2000 since the spring of 2021 and when i say spring for the purposes of right now i'm talking about april through june and so you can see here that um northeastern minnesota had a super dry spring in 2020 in fact it was drier and it was the second driest on record in northeastern minnesota we, so dakota county is included in minnesota's southeastern growing zone so, you know, it's at the very top, of, of course. So this probably isn't the best way to, to talk specifically about Dakota County, but you can see we haven't had a dry spring in the southeastern Minnesota as dry of a spring since 1992. It's been a long time. North, back to the northern part of the state, it was the fourth straight dry spring for northeastern Minnesota and the sixth straight dry spring for north central and northwestern Minnesota. Now, not every one of those years would be really a serious drought but it was below the long-term average. When I say the long-term average, I'm saying 1895 to 1990. Okay, and southeastern Minnesota now has been wet. And it, this spring for the southeastern climate zone was our first below average spring since, since, two, since for, tw for the last 12 years. We haven't had a dry spring for 12 years in all of southeastern Minnesota. What about summer? In, just for, for this purpose, I'm, I'm saying summer is July through the end of September. When was it drier last? Um, well, I'm not including these parts of Minnesota because, in, for example, central Minnesota had a, its precipitation in 2020 run from July through the end of September was normal. Um, east central, you know, it and northwestern, it, the last time it was drier was in 2012 or 2013. Now, 2012, July through September of 2012 was the driest on record statewide for that period on record. Um, so 
again, East Central Minnesota hasn't experienced a dry summer for eight years. It's been wet, very wet. Um, what about the entire growing season? Now, April through September. Um, it hasn't been drier since these years. Last time it was drier in southeastern Minnesota was in 2012. In the Arrowhead, last time it was drier was in 1976. 1976 just so happens to be the driest growing season on record for the state of Minnesota. And again, northeastern Minnesota has experienced four straight dry growing seasons. And again, it's been wetter. The, the trend has been wet in, in the southern half of the state, for sure. June was really hot, June of 2021. It was ridiculously hot. Here is a map showing the difference from the, from the average, the average being 1981 to 2010. And this shows you the, the degrees difference from that average. So you can see, you know, Dakota County for the most part, let's see, that was seven to 10 degrees above the, the average for the month of June. So it was really hot. Um, in fact, 2021 statewide for June, it was the third hottest June on record. Um, the last time it was hotter in June in southeastern Minnesota was 1933. Um, you see 1988 in there. 1988 was the hottest growing season on record. I remember that drought running around my, my parents' yard in my bare feet and the dry grass just being so stiff, hurting my feet. I remember that drought. Okay, so what happened with the trees? Well, here is a oak, a bur oak from my yard in Dakota County. This happened <clears throat> at the end of June. Uh, we went, I think we went on a family vacation in early June and I came back and I looked at my yard and it looked like this, all those leaves on the ground. And I was like, my oak can't have oak wilt because those are the symptoms of oak wilt. Um, but I was worried, you know, but I looked closely at these leaves in the canopy and the leaves that were turning brown and falling off of the tree were not the leaves on the tip of branches. They weren't the leaves growing out of the tip. They were the leaves growing kind of back on the new growth. We call that leaf scorch. Here's a sugar maple in Morrison County in central Minnesota. This was in mid-July. So it was showing fall colors around the periphery. And if you take a look at this yard, you can see all these sugar maple leaves falling to the ground. And this happened very commonly in late June and early July all over. Um, this red oak on the left is from uh, sapling and uh, old red, northern red oak sapling in St. Paul. Um, the Burroak seedlings right here are in Sherburne County. Um, and then these are some basswood leaves from Morrison County on that stump. This is leaf scorch. This also happened in 1988 and 1976. And leaf scorch is just a broad leaf, broad leafed trees way of coping with water loss. What better way to stop water loss than to shed your canopy? It's an adaptation. Um, historically, when this happened, most of these trees survived just fine. So that was June. And now that one, one comment, I forget if I mentioned this, but this happened, it wasn't just because of the drought. It was because of the extreme heat that we experienced in June. That is why, it, so that the combination of extreme heat and drought promoted this leaf scorch. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about kind of more serious things that happened with the drought, but I'm also kind of continuing on with leaf scorch, but in a more severe case. Um, so in late June, uh, I was doing some aerial survey over Morrison County and I saw a tremendous amount of oaks that were losing their entire canopy. It was happening all over the county. It was a mystery. There were leaves falling all over, but they were losing like 90% of their leaves. The um, common denominator in all of these situations, though, is that they were 
either recently grazed or currently grazed their pasture oaks. Um, the other common denominator in this part of Minnesota is that it's been ridiculously wet. I know 2019 growing season in Morrison County was the eighth wet, wettest on record. 2017 was the 10th wettest on record. So you're having this situation where you're having extreme soil compaction from cattle grazing combined with extreme precipitation, which causes the soil to just stay saturated forever. And that kills roots. And then you have uh, a drought come along and when there's a drought, trees need as many roots as possible. Um, and the, the trees just can't get enough water into their canopy. And you had sudden leaf scorch. It was very drastic. Um, I said all those things. I said all those things. Um, yeah. So that's what happened. It was shocking. And I do expect a lot of these trees to die. Um, I did see this also in, in a, a, on a couple of baroques in Carver County, actually, just west of here. Um, maples also uh, showed severe, showed indications of severe drought stress this year. Um, in very rare circumstances, I saw a sudden death on maples. Now this maple here is actually a campground in Carver County, and it just rapidly dies. It died. I have never seen anything like that happen before. I, I, I didn't dig down too deep, but I don't think it had um, stem girdling roots. But it wasn't a campground. Um, Carver County experienced an extremely wet growing season in 2018. I think it was in the top 10. And in a campground situation where you have a lot of tra foot traffic, a major soil compaction that kills a lot of roots. And then if you have a drought come along, it has kills more roots. The trees can't, can't get enough. Um, a lot of the branches were covered in these black fungal fruiting bodies. If you look closely, you'll see these black marks all over these branches that had just died from this sugar maple. And these are uh, an opportunistic fungus that kills the cambium and rapidly kills the tree. Um, I did notice some, some yard maples in my neighborhood in a community in Dakota County um, start showing a lot of active dieback in July of 2021. I also got reports of that happening to some degree in Mankato and then also up toward Brainerd. And in my neighborhood, that dieback was happening on the same exact trees that rapidly developed dieback in spring of 2019. And in spring of 2019, we it was a guess, but it was an educated guess. We guessed that those trees developed dieback in spring of 2019 because the winter of 2018 lacked snow past Christmas. So you had all December of 2018, there was no snow. Um, maples are notorious for developing dieback after winters like that because their roots get frozen near the soil surface. And when you have roots die, that translates into die back in the canopy. Those maples in my neighborhood anyways, seemed to recover in 2020, but then along comes this nasty June, dry June, hot June, dry July, and die back continued on those trees. Okay, something else I noticed a lot of this past year, 2021, was that previously flooded trees died. Um, you can see this is a wet, a shot of a wetland in central Minnesota, and you can see these areas of totally brown dying red oaks around this wetland. Those red oaks previously had, as we say, wet feet. They were completely flooded in 2019, and that flooding duration happened for a long time. Now this, take a close look at these oaks here. You can see there's like this marshy grass here. 
Um, on the opposite side, though, they, they were high and dry. So it's like half the root system was flooded for at least one year, if not multiple years. You can imagine, I mean, roots need oxygen to survive. And so when you get water over roots, over an upland piece, like an oak, over those roots, those roots, they just die. So that these trees lack any roots right down there that can get them any moisture. Then you get a drought com coming along, the waters recede, and the trees just lack sufficient roots. So they die. Um, and they trees almost never die on their own. Um, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm getting distracted. I see this red line. Do you guys see that red line? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I wonder if we can get rid of that red line. There's two of them, actually. I wonder if, let me see if I can erase these. Oh, bear with me here, eraser. Oh my gosh, look at that. I swear mm -hmm. I did not put those red lines on, but <laughs> anyway, okay. Back to these flooded trees. So like I said, trees almost never die from one, from one environmental event. You know, there are all kinds of native pests. I'm sure many of you or all of you have learned about these native pests that take advantage of stressed trees, stressed plants even. Here's a shot on the right of, a, of an insect called the two-lined chestnut borer. Two-lined chestnut borer is a native beetle, and it makes these kind of etch-a-sketch tunnels between the bark and the wood. They, it feeds on the cambium. It operates just like emerald ash borer. The only difference is it's native. Um, it attacks stressed oaks. It's notorious for doing so. Um, and so it was attacking a lot of these stressed oaks. Um, pines growing near wetlands also died this past year. This, this is a pine near um, Willow River in kind of more northern Pine County, north of Hinkley. Um, so yeah, whenever you have flooding, that predisposes trees to further damage. So uh, kind of highly sad soils for a long period in one growing season, those trees are weakened. If you have another harmful environmental event like a drought, those trees are weakened further and they attract all kinds of pests and pathogens and they die. Um, Northwestern Minnesota, way up there, um, north, of, north of Bemidji, uh, there, were, there was noticeable bark beetle outbreaks in pine plantations. And what was really interesting is that, of course, those trees were attacked by these bark beetles in the summer because they were so drought stressed. And in some instances, they were stressed from being, being thinned that this past spring. And um, even though these trees were completely attacked, their canopy stayed green until the later fall. And then they started turning orange. And that's very common with conifers. Um, lots of times I'll, I'll be out investigating a problem in the woods for a forester and I'll see that the, these trees, you know, like half, 75% of their root systems are infected by a root disease or they're totally infested with bark beetles, yet their canopies look healthy. That's quite common with conifers. Um, and then they frequently change color and turn orange over the course of the winter. Bark beetles, if you aren't familiar with what they do, they're these tiny little beetles. They drill into the bark, into the inner bark, um, and they frequently they leave these deposits of sawdust that you can see here on this white pine here and here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. You probably can't here and here. Um, their canopies rapidly change color at some point. So that happened in Northwestern Wisconsin. Or Northwestern Minnesota. I used to work in Wisconsin. Sorry about that, folks. Mm -hmm. um, so what's, what's going to happen next year? Well, it totally depends on the weather, of course. If we have a drought again, and 
frequently we do. You know, um, 1987 was a severe drought year in for certain parts of the upper Midwest, as well as 1988. Um, 2013, in some in certain parts of the state was extreme. It broke records in certain parts of the state. Of course, 2012 was extremely dry. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens next year. And I hope we don't have a drought. But if we do, we can expect um, some pretty serious outbreaks of bark beetles. I should have put a picture on this slide to show you what happened around the Twin Cities in 1988. But if you can envision um, kind of the suburbs north of the Twin Cities, like Blaine, Circle Pines, even upwards towards Cambridge, it's flat, sandy country. There are red pine plantations everywhere. And you had um, upwards of 70% of some plantations being killed in one year. Um, that year was an extreme drought, but it was in many instances the second year of a drought. So of course, if that happens again, we're gonna see bark beetle outbreaks. There's also disease. I'm sure many of you, if you've taken tree health seminars or whatever, have heard of diplodia. Diplodia is a fungal disease of conifers, particularly it, it um, damages like red pines, jack pines, Austrian pines, ponderosa pines. In most instances, it causes a shoot blight. So it, it'll just kill like, you know, the end of the, sh the shoot, um, kind of like right here. See that shoot right there? But in after extreme drought, it can kill entire tops of red pines. So again, if we have a drought in 2023, I would expect that. This is a, there was an outbreak of a little branch beetle called there's no common name for it. The genus is Pityogenes. This happened in 2013 around the Twins from, from about St. Cloud over to Stillwater. All these, you know, like 30 foot tall white pines from in that huge area of central Minnesota to east central Minnesota lost their tops because of a bark beetle outbreak. Again, 2013 in that part of the state was even drier than 2012 in the summer. Um, just some basic tips for minimizing bark beetle damage in, in, con in all conifers, really. Um, but in like, for example, in ornamental red pines in your yard, get rid of sickly pines. Um, if, if half the crown is orange right now, if you're able to cut that down and get rid of it before April of 2022, then you're removing a, a food source for bark beetles because bark beetles they really are attracted to distressed pines. So if your pine's gonna die anyways, you, you'd be doing a lot of good with, by getting rid of it now. Um, and of course, watering trees, infrequently and slowly and deeply. That almost sounds like a song. Um, so, and I only recommend watering pines or, or any trees if we're like, we're below, the monthly average by roughly uh, an inch. That's when it's like, it's getting kind of serious. Um, you can look online, the University of Minnesota has some guide, guidance about watering trees. I really like to use the Morton Arboretum's website, how to care for landscape level trees. Um, you can really get into the weeds on measuring soil moisture and everything, but. I generally think that's too complicated for most people. Water once a week, all night long with a drip hose right at the drip line for, for a large tree. That's the thing to do. Um, in our state, um, we have a lot of oaks. The, no, the most numerous tree that's 17 inches in diameter or bigger in the entire state of Minnesota is bur oak. Um, Northern red oak is our third most abundant tree. That's 17 inches or larger in diameter, right at your chest height. Um, so we have a lot of oaks, so everyone notices them. Um, historically though, after all of these major droughts we've had in the state, we've lost thousands of acres of oak forests. Um, I expect that to happen starting next year in Northwestern Minnesota for sure. If we get another serious drought in central Minnesota, southeastern Minnesota, I would expect that to occur. And those massive losses of oaks, they, they occur for two to three years. 
Um, and it's all because of that two line chestnut borer. Two line chestnut borer, you know, the drought of 2021, it, it enabled it to, to have a robust population. All those adults will pop out in May of 2022. They'll lay their eggs. Um, their population will be huge and you'll see a lot of oaks die. Um, many of you have probably heard of armillary root disease too. Armillary root disease, it's this ubiquitous soil pathogen that attacks, as far as I know, every tree species we have. Um, armillaria is unique in that it can grow through the soil without growing on a substrate, without feeding on anything. So it can actually grow from like a stump where it's been hanging out for like a decade. It can actively grow through the soil, like I don't know how many feet to a living root and it's attracted to stressed roots. Um, so these are just examples that I saw this year. Actually, this oak on the right was in somebody's yard in rural Wabasha County, not too far away. Um, and that oak was in the understory and that oak was solely being killed by armillary root disease. And that was near St. Cloud. Um, you can see here where I said um, armillary and flat-headed wood borers. So flat-headed wood borers, it's a family of beetles that um, emerald ash borer is a flat-headed wood borer, two-lined chestnut borer is a flat-headed wood borer, bronze birch borer is a flat-headed wood borer, bronze poplar borer is a flat-headed wood borer. They are all in this genus called a gryllus. And this is just how native a gryllus operate. When they're stressed, we lose trees. 1988, we lost a bunch of birch to bronze poplar borer after that. So the, these, it, it's going to happen this year. Um, I don't know how bad it will be in Dakota County. Um, here are just some shots, some pictures. If you see D-shaped exit holes on an oak, it's from two line chestnut borer adults that left the tree. The damage is done in that part of the trunk. You know, if you peel away the bark, you might see these very characteristic beetle larvae here. Um, and they leave these kind of twisty or etch-a-sketch-like galleries. Um, now here are these, okay, so this is an oak on the left. See all this hair-like stuff? These are the long-term survival structures of armillaria. Um, and <laughs> It's, it's amazing, like armillary, when you find armillary on oak tree, doesn't necessarily mean that armillary killed that oak tree because armillary can also act as a decayer. Um, it's on every, if you don't find armillary on a dead broadleaf tree or, or conifer, it would be unusual. It's that common. When it's actively killing tissue though, it forms this white mycelial fan this actually glows in the dark. Mark Twain referred to it as foxfire in the woods. Um, so that's our malaria. Um, again, I expect you know drought stress to promote attack by flat-headed wood borers and our malaria on a number of species. Here's an example of it on at on trembling at tre at on aspen. Um, here's a the bronze poplar borer feeding tunnels, and then here's armillary at the base. These are very bright white mycelial fans from armillaria um, that when you see that, the fungus is killing the cambium. Okay, so what to do about all of this? I bet you, get, you can guess what I'm going to say, but maybe not that second bullet point. Fertilizing is very stressful to drought stress trees. Um, in my opinion, you don't want to fertilize your tree unless you really know exactly what it needs. Um, of course, mulching trees helps retain that soil moisture amongst other things. So that's good to do to retain soil moisture. Um, I would, I would avoid fertilizing trees in 2020, Of course, and like I, like I said, with bark beetle prevention, if you water trees, that'd be good. I, I say here, um, if any of you are, in, are injecting or, or 
hiring an arborist company to inject an oak, for example, to prevent two-lined chestnut borer attack, it's still really important to keep those trees watered when we're in drought because an insecticide injection isn't going to do a darn thing about preventing our malaria attack. Um, and I would love it if a researcher would, would look, would compare the effectiveness between just watering your oaks at preventing two-line chestnut borer or watering your birch at preventing bronze birch borer versus injecting them with an insecticide. I have a sneaking suspicion that if you just water properly, that will go, that will be just as effective at preventing attack by those opportunistic pests than injection. I could be totally wrong. It, it, it would be really good for a researcher to test that out though. Um, and of course, now a lot of these, unlike bark beetles, bark be those are main bark beetles pest of conifers, the, the pine engraver, it overwinters in the, in the duff layer, in, in the upper part, part of the soil. Flat-headed wood borers, like emerald ash borer, um, two-line chestnut borer, bronze poplar borer, bronze birch borer, they overwinter in the bark. So if you have a aspen, for example, that looks like this, if you're able to cut it down in the wintertime and let's say burn that wood before May or I don't know, chip it up, you're killing thousands of overwintering larvae. Um, so in a, in a community, that might be actually kind of beneficial to your, to your yard and your neighbor's yard. So that's something you could do too. Um, we're looking for oak wool very hard. We're trying to slow its spread yeah, um, at basically halfway up Minnesota, just north of, if you know where Sandstone is, which is just north of Hinkley, from a line from about Sandstone or Hinkley over to Little Falls, or really over to Brainerd. We're trying to hold Oakwood at bay. And I'm really worried about what's gonna happen in 2022, because all kinds of oaks are gonna look like that on the right. Um, and people are going to think it's oak wilt, and we're going to get flooded with reports, and it's going to be tough for DNR staff for sure handling all these calls. Um, this could easily happen in Dakota County too. My best uh, tip for for differentiating two line chestnut borer and oak wilt is that oak wilt they lose leaves really fast in the growing season when. It can happen at the end of June, um, July, August, early September. If you're if your yard or you're walking through Lebanon Hills, like this picture on the left with my lovely dog, if you're walking in July or August and you're walking over a carpet of leaves and some of those oak leaves are green, or if you're in the thicker woods, you're bushwhacking and you see these ferns and the ferns are covered with freshly fallen oak leaves, that's that's oak wilt. With, with trees that die of two-line chestnut borer, those dead leaves stay up in the canopy for a considerable amount of time. Whereas oak wilt, you lose 90% of the leaves to the ground. They just fall off in over one to two months. Now that's just, I'm just talking about red oaks there. So with two-line chestnut borer, you frequently get this pattern of dead, little part of dieback, and then the next part of the crown dies, some lower branches remain green. That's the pattern with two-line chestnut borer. With oak wilt, you get symptom development and then you get rapid leaf loss over the course of one to two months. Wow, I've already spoke for 46 minutes and I still have a bit to, to, um, to cover here, but I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna stop at 7.50 if that's okay and take questions. This was remarkable to me, you guys. Um, you know, so I started this this line of work in 2007. I worked in sugar maple country for the first seven years of my career in northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin. Then I moved here. Every year, late February, mid February, we get reports occasionally of squirrels feeding on sugar maples. It's common in late winter 
in winter, last winter, so 2020, 2021, we started getting reports in central Minnesota in January that it's happening. Actually, December. Highly unusual. And, and it extended in, into January. And um, some forester, I told some foresters up in like Cannabis County um, near Mora and then way down in Houston County near La Crescent. And they were like, yeah, we're seeing more squirrels too. Squirrel feeding. You can see there are little incisor marks. There are these parallel lines here that you can see on the right. Um, and in, when I was doing aerial survey over Pine County, you know, kind of east of Hinckley, I would see all these sugar maples flagging. And it was all because of, of um, squirrel feeding. I had never seen anything like it in my career. Um, in the woods, it looked like this. Um, you can see all this damage here from squirrel feeding. And um, the a professor at South Dakota State University, Professor John Ball, said, suggested that maybe the sugar content of the sap was higher because of a warm fall. So I looked at our climate records where this was happening and <laughs> Um, November 2020 to January 2021, it was the fifth warmest such period on record where, where we were seeing this squirrel damage. So maybe that professor had, maybe the sugar's content were, was higher than usual. Maybe the squirrels were attracted to that. But, but I kept thinking, well, you need, you know, to see a, a ton of squirrel damage, you need a lot of squirrels. And what's interesting is that, um, for the time that the DM, the DNR kind of has the citizen science approach to tracking bear food. Of course, the important part of bear food is acorn production. So, so when you pull out the acorn data in these parts of Minnesota where this was happening, um, 2018 was like a, a record year. 2019 in certain parts was a record year. Actually, um, I know in Egan, acorns in 2019 were off the charts. And in 2020, they were higher too. So maybe the squirrel population was just gigantic from these huge populations of acorn. I, and word has it from one person up in Otter Tail County that 2021 acorn production is not significant. So I just wanted to share that. It was just something really interesting that I've seen in my, that I had never seen in my career. Um, introduced basswood thrips. Uh, this is my first outbreak that I've seen in Minnesota since I moved here in 2019. I didn't see any of it in Dakota County, but in these shaded counties um, up by Lake Mariah State Park, actually, and then westward over to, um, oh, what's that state park over there in Candy Yohai County, Northern Candy Yohai County, Sibley State Park. There were some severely damaged sugar maple or basswood leaves over there. And that was because of a non-native critter called the introduced basswood thrips. And if you look at my thumbnail there, you'll see, let's see if I have a highlighter here. Here, I'll circle it. I'm not very proficient with this. Okay, I'm not going to. Just look at my thumbnail. There's this little green line on it right there. That's what an, that's how big an introduced basswood thrips is um, here. And there are some on the end of my thumb too. They end up, defoliating basswoods occasionally in the, in the early spring. It looks like frost damage, but it's not. It's introduced basswood thrips feeding. I know they can feed on uh, European linden too. Um, I'm not worried about it. You know, hardwood, hardwood broadleaf trees can tolerate a tremendous amount of leaf feeding, even you know, a couple of years in a row before they start, start suffering. Um, but that's just something to kind of keep your eyes out for. Um, oak wilt crept north last year. We found it north of Brainerd. I am very concerned about the landscape in this area. If you've ever seen an area that's been devastated by oak wilt, it's super ugly. It's going to hurt businesses. It's going to hurt property owners. Um, we found it in northwestern Pine County. This is the farthest north it is. Um, Currently, oak wilt's impacting about 40% of the range of northern red oak, so I like to talk about it a lot because it's one of the few invasive forest health problems that we know how to control, and we stand a good chance at slowing its spread. Um, so wherever you're at in Minnesota, I would ask that you don't move firewood 
within a year of death. Because if, you, if, if a tree dies of oak wilt, um, it, it has about a 40% chance of producing oak wilt spores the next spring or the next fall, and then it won't produce any spores again. So a year from death, it's harmless in terms of moving oak wilt. But of course, it could harbor two-land chestnut borers. So if you just wait for two years before you move that wood up to your cabin or whatever, you're doing, you're preventing movement of potentially some nasty stuff. And of course, if you're able to avoid wounding or even nicking an oak root with a lawnmower, April through July, that's, you could be preventing a lot of um, infection from oak wilt. Um, I got two minutes here. It's not a big deal. A lot of people are worried about it. It looks bad. I've I've done I've surveyed a lot of bur oaks over the course of many years, and my predecessor surveyed oaks for one oak for like seventeen years. It's it looks so much worse than it really is. Here are um, plots from two thousand twenty one. I looked at about 500 oaks, 500 bur oaks here. And you can see the worst, the highest incidence of bur oak blight was 3%. And those 3%, they, they look bad, but they'll leaf out just fine in May of 2022. I have no doubts that bur oak blight picks on stressed bur oaks. When people think that a, a bur oak is dying because of bur oak blight, I would ask them to look at it several more times and think about oh, what else is stressing this bur oak because almost always something else is. And some bur oaks, even if you have a dry May, they will get bur oak blight. And typically those ones are stressed by something like severe compaction, something like that, root, root damage. Emerald ash borer, it's in this area you look at this dakota county still doesn't isn't in the in the area considered generally infested in the far southern part of the county like cannon falls area i'm sure that'll fit in or fill in over the years but that's interesting to see this is the 13 year spread here in minnesota it's not spreading very fast in minnesota relative to other states and we can thank early detection because of that people following the quarantine because of that. And also we can thank minus 30 degrees. Big time. It gets down to minus 30 like earlier up here. And for as long as that's gonna happen, emerald ash borer will be a problem. Um, now, of course, that's gonna happen less and less. And it is, I just don't know how long Northern Minnesota is going to continue to see minus 30. Last thing I'm gonna mention, if you ever see any walnuts completely encased in caterpillar webbing, I'd like to know, just email me. There's a student, um, we, we confirmed for the first time a caterpillar slash moth in Minnesota that we, we confirmed it actually damaging trees for the first time in 2020. In 2021, and it just happened at this little spot down here by Lanesboro. In 2021, it wasn't as bad, but it got worse in Wisconsin and Iowa. And this is walnut here in July, pictured on the left. And it looks white because that's it's encased in webbing. It was, it was remarkable to see. Here's a kind of a close up of the webbing in July. Um, and here's a string of these caterpillars hanging. There's no common name for them. They're called Gretchenna amatana. Um, and this is, you know, they start off like this in late June and then they grow into something like this. But bottom line is if you see webbing on walnuts, and I'd, I'd like to know because there's a student at, a grad student at University of Wisconsin-Madison who got a little grant to kind of explore the life cycle of these. So um, I need spots for her. So the sick part of me, hopes that we see a little bit of this net this coming this this coming growing season. I'm not worried for the walnuts, but because again, caterpillars, they make trees look ugly when they feed on their foliage, but it's not that problematic as long as there's not like a concurrent really severe drought. Okay, I'm done. Sorry I went over there, everyone.
Thanks, Brian. We have a couple questions in the chat. Oh, um, the oh, first yeah. the first question is from Robert. He says a couple of trees near my house seem to be losing their bark. Why is this happening? Trees can lose bark for all kinds of reasons. Um, there is a little chat at the beginning before I started speaking about woodpeckers and and um, one reason that woodpeckers will take bark off trees is to feed on larvae under the trees, beetle larvae typically. Um, so that's one reason why beetles, why, why trees can lose their bark. Another reason they can lose their bark is the cambium is dead and it's been dead for a number of years. And when, when the, you know, the cambium is the, it's like the living, the living portion of bark that produces the, the tubes that carry up and down nutrients and water in a tree called, they're called xylem and phloem, if you've heard of that. So if a tree, and the, there's like a single layer of cambium under the bark, and if you kill that, the tree, die, that part of the tree dies. So you could be losing bark because of that. And then Kathy's question is, is there any way to treat an oak that is infected with a two line, excuse me, with a two lined chestnut borer? Um, I imagine so, because we know that if you inject an infested ash with th that's infested with armored ash borer and, and it's still like, its canopy still has less than 25% dieback or so, or even I think like the chemical manufacturer says 50%, but I've heard from several arborists that, yeah, they'll inject an ash that has only lost 25% of its canopy and they can save it from emerald ash borer as long as that's injected like once every other year or once every third year with triage. Triage, the like the, the chemical, the active ingredient in the insecticide triage is called emamectin benzoate. Um, and I imagine if you, I mean, two-line chestnut borer is very similar to emerald ash borer. So I'm guessing that if you're, Oak is lightly infested with two-line chestnut borer. You inject it with triage or MMX and benzoate. You could save it. I also think, though, that if you, you know, if you properly water your oak, you know, in May if it's dry, that might go. That might give the tree a leg up in defending itself from further attack. Other things, other things though, can kill um, can kill the branches of oaks. So it might not be too long just to work. Okay, Lisa, had a, uh, Lisa had a question about um, pests that are attracted um, to the trees. Are they attracted only when the trees are stressed? And if so, how did the pests know? Or are the pests always around and the healthy trees are just better at fighting them off? Oh boy, that's a complex question. Um, so trees, uh, when they're, I, I, I mean, I wish I was a tree physiologist, but I'm not. So I'm kind of, uh, I know a little about a lot of stuff when it comes to this topic. Um, so I guess I'll share a little bit about what I know. Um, trees are like chemical factories. I mean, plants are, they're chemical factories. And, you know, like a healthy tree, it, re it releases a certain perfume, let's just say. When it's sick, that perfume changes. And insects over the eons have evolved to detect those changes. And, you know, when an, it, when a, when an insect attacks a healthy tree, there's like an immediate response. There's a, there's a physical response, there's a chemical response. And so trees do have this, uh, uh, a suite of defensive chemicals that that are either that there's a certain there's a certain suite of chemicals that are always there that are defensive, and then there's a, another suite of chemicals that trees can manufacture very quickly to defend themselves. When they when they're under stress, they don't have as many carbohydrates to produce those complex. I think they're called secondary metabolites that they they don't have enough energy basically to produce the defensive compounds so that so insects are more they're more 
they can more easily overcome the defensive capabilities of trees. So insects are more attracted to, to stress trees because of like chemistry and they can't, and they like certain, like a really healthy tree can defend itself from insect attack. Now, when, when a whole forest, a whole region is stressed because of weather events, I mean, over, over time, the insect pest population increases. Certain insects, then they reach a certain point where they indiscriminately attack any tree of that host. And if you've heard of like mountain pine beetle, for example, the, the Rocky Mountains in the United States and Canada and the Sierras, I think it even it might have extended to the Sierras. I mean, they underwent like a decade of mountain pine beetle attack. And that, you know, they, th these insects got in outbreak mode, meaning that normally when their population is really small, they behave differently. When they're in outbreak mode, they'll attack any tree and they can overcome even healthy trees by sheer numbers. We have an insect in Minnesota called the Eastern March beetle, which is actually very closely related to the mountain pine beetle that has been in outbreak mode since 2001. This is the, 2021 was the 20th year of outbreak of this insect. And we've currently lost like 60% of, well, this insect has affected 60% of Minnesota's tamarack forests. So that was a really long answer. Sorry about that. But why did these these um, insects, what makes them go into this kind of overdrive mode? I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure, you know, the, um, the university, and I don't think this happens with all insects. For example, two-line chestnut borer, I'm guessing, only attacks stressed oaks. It's just okay. that after we have like super severe drought, every oak is stressed for like a couple years, you know? Um, there is, we, there's a fantastic professor. I think he lives in Dakota County in, at the University of Minnesota, Professor Alkama, Brian Alkama. He's kind of a, a, a insect olfactory expert. And so he could explain to you guys how this actually happens physiologically in, with insects. And I'm sure just about any entomology prof at the University of Minnesota could tell you that I'm not sure about how that works. I just know what happens. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for, very much. thanks for the invitation. And hopefully we'll have the perfect amount of precipitation this year because it's just been a little too extreme. So good luck to us in Dakota County. <laughs>